Welcome to the PGP for Crypto podcast, where we have in-depth discussions on cryptocurrency policy and regulation. I'm Paul Brigner, and I'm head of U.S. policy and strategic advocacy at the Electric Coin Company. As always, this podcast is not legal or financial advice. However, we are here to deepen our understanding of complex policy and regulatory issues and work towards the development of pretty good policy for the cryptocurrency world. Today's episode is different from our previous ones in that our focus today is all about Global Encryption Day, and it is intended to provide some background for the upcoming PGP Congressional Lunch Briefing on October 17th, 2023, 11.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. at the Congressional Auditorium in the U.S. Capitol Visitor Center. I will provide more information about that event later in our discussion. But first, I would like to introduce our guest today, Ryan Polk. Ryan is Director of Internet Policy at the Internet Society, which is also known as ISOC, where he has been promoting pretty good policy for the Internet for the last seven years, I think. And I can say firsthand that he does a great job at that because we actually worked together for a bit at Internet Society. I think that was back around 2014 to 2015. At that time, Ryan was a project assistant where he was a big help to me in the work I was doing. He's since been promoted a few times, rising to his current role. And, and he's one of the lead people there at the Internet Society working on Global Encryption Day. So way back then, Ryan and I were also working on the use of encryption on the internet. We, we've been at this a very long time now, and that is a topic we both deeply care about. I recall organizing a few events back then, um, specifically on encryption when I was working at ISOC. And in fact, a close friend, David Bjorst, and I produced a documentary video. It's called The Internet Exposed, Encryption, Backdoors, and Privacy and the quest to maintain trust. I actually think that video is just as relevant today as it was when we made it. So I encourage everyone to check that out on YouTube and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Ryan also helped last year when we celebrated Global Encryption Day as part of the PGP for Crypto Breakfast. And we had some special guests. Ryan gave some great remarks talking about the need for global encryption and uh, particular threats that um, he saw around the world. And that's part of what I hope that he'll do today is uh, give us some of that background and provide some context that will be helpful to everyone as they go into participating in our Global Encryption Day event that's just less than two weeks away now. So Ryan, uh, I think now's appropriate time to let you introduce yourself and uh, maybe you can tell us about your personal history and what you do at ISOC in a little bit more detail than what I did. And then we'll go from there to get into more of your work on encryption and then Global Encryption Day. So please take it away. Thanks, Paul, and really happy to be here and excited to be speaking to you, your community about encryption and uh, your all's plans for, for Global Encryption Day uh, later this, this month. Um, first off, I gotta say that video is, is fantastic from, uh, from Dave Yurst and you as well. David is a fantastic filmmaker, also has a great uh, documentary about basketball and Jewish basketball players in uh, the, the in New York City um, during the, the 60s and 70s that I highly recommend uh, people check out. Um, so I have been working at the Internet Society for about seven years now, um, mainly on cybersecurity related issues, uh, trying to keep bad ideas that are coming up all around the world, uh, especially when it comes relates to uh, encryption um, from becoming bad policy. Uh, so trying to keep pretty good policy and keep out the pretty bad policy or very bad policy in some cases. Um, and so the last four years, my focus has been entirely, almost entirely on encryption. Um, encryption is one of the most important tools that we have out there for protecting our security and privacy online and even now more and more in the offline world as well. Unfortunately, encryption is under threat around the world, uh, particularly by governments who want access to everyone's data um, in the name of usually public safety um, or other reasons as well. Um, and uh, because there's that threat, there's really a need to, to push back against it. And so in, in some ways, it's it's been a lot of fun fighting against these threats and 
uh, threats are always weird and they always come up in, in different ways. Um, on the other hand, it can be a grind because there are so many threats to encryption all around the world right now and they just don't go away. Um, I could joke about having lots of job security, but this is the sort of uh, job security that you don't want to have uh, because the threats, fighting threats is, is it would be much better if this encryption debate was over and won and I never had to talk about encryption again, but here we are. On that point, um, I, I like to think that some of these encryption debates did play out and they were won. And in fact, um, there's some fantastic books about that. I think it's what crypto is one and, and others that talk all about the, the early crypto wars in the early 90s. And one of our guest speakers at the breakfast last year was Phil Zimmerman, who is the software developer behind PGP, which for those who don't know, everything I do that is called PGP is in homage to PGP encryption which was an email encryption tool, still is today, in fact, still used today um, in certain communities. But uh, yeah, it, for, at that time, it was, it was just groundbreaking. And it was the first one that was widely accessible. Um, and I was able to use it. So many people were able to get exposed to the first use of encryption. And it went on to spark some very serious debates. Um, that recording from our last breakfast, I believe, is also out there. It wasn't the absolute best quality, unfortunately, but it is still worth watching. And you can hear directly from Phil talking about that. Um, so, man, Ryan, you've been at this such a long time. And um, and like you say, it's a grind. And how do we win this battle? It's just unbelievable that again and again and again, this comes up. It just seems to never die, even though when rational people get together and they really hash it out, it always turns out that we safeguard encryption. So, so far we're winning, but is that something that is going to be sustainable? So the encryption debate is actually in a really weird place around the world right now. Um, there's a lot to be optimistic about, um, but at the same time, there's significant threats as well. Um, the reason that I'm optimistic is all around the world, you see more and more companies, especially large companies, rolling out end-to-end -end encrypted products. End-to-end -end encryption is a type of encryption where basically only the sender and the intended re intended recipient or recipients can access the uh, the contents of those messages. Only they hold the keys to do that. That means that, for instance, if you're using something like WhatsApp or Signal, which is an end-to-end -end encrypted messaging service, uh, Meta, for the owner of WhatsApp, can't gain access to those communications, and Signal can't gain access to your communications as well, because it's end-to-end -end encrypted. So we're seeing a lot of companies roll out end-to-end -end encryption by default, over, especially over the past year, um, and actually step back from doing methods that could potentially undermine encryption. Um, so for instance, in this past year, we've seen uh, Google roll out end-to-end -end encryption by default on RCS, which is their messaging, uh, uh, internet messaging service. We've also heard Meta announce that they're going to roll out end-to-end -end encryption by default for their messenger service. Um, and uh, recently, Apple also has decided not to roll out a client-side scanning te technique on their um, uh, Apple Photos um, on, on iCloud. And so you see a lot of these big companies taking steps to introduce more encryption, better encryption, and roll that out on a mass scale. And so this year especially, we're seeing more and more people around the world being able to have access, easy access to end-to-end -end encrypted technologies. So that gives me a lot of optimism because the market is moving towards end-to-end -to -end encryption. Um, and the market, especially big players, are moving towards end-to-end -to -end encryption as well bringing a lot of people those the the value that that's that's there at the same time we're seeing a reactionary effort from governments um as you're talking earlier about the crypto wars uh over the past 25 30 years um it's important to realize that the motivations behind undermining encryption have not changed um they haven't changed from day one of the crypto wars before the crypto wars until today 
at its core, some governments and some law enforcement uh, agencies are concerned that end-to-end encryption prevents them from getting access to private communications. Um, some governments may want access to those communications for very legitimate, seemingly positive purposes of protecting children or catching criminals. Um, other governments, however, want access to those communications to attack dissidents, attack journalists, uh, attack ac- activists, that sort of thing. Uh, the fundamental problem that will never really be resolved in this in these crypto wars is that there is no way to provide a third party with access to end-to-end encrypted communications without severely undermining the security and privacy of the system for everyone. You can't do it in a targeted way. And so what you're basically doing with uh, creating third-party access is creating a vulnerability that can't be patched. Um, This is a security vulnerability that could be found by criminals or other bad actors and used to hack into people's uh, systems and gain access to their communications. And at the Internet Society, us and a lot of of other organizations, academics, um, even some governments, agree that there is no way of doing that safely. And that is really the fundamental problem in this debate, is that you have this desire from governments and some law enforcement agencies to gain access to these communications, but there's no way of doing that safely. And so right now in our debate worldwide, we're seeing more and more governments. I, I think governments are scared. I think that's that's the way to put it. Governments see that more and more of of the world is moving to end-to-end encryption. There's so much value in it for, for users and security and privacy for users. And they're afraid that they aren't going to have uh, the level of access that they got used to. If you look back before the Snowden revelations in the early 2000s to, I guess, early uh, 2010s, governments had an incredible amount of access to private communications all around the world. And I say governments, but I really mean certain Western governments. We didn't know the scale of this access until the Snowden revelations. But the reason for that is that End-to-end encryption and really encryption wasn't used to its fullest extent on the internet. And so you had a lot of messages being sent in in an unsecure manner. You had data being sent in an unsecure manner across the internet. And so you had uh, uh, snooping happening from governments gaining access to all of those communications. And so there was really a dark ages for privacy online from the early 2000s to just about the Snowden revelations. And once the Snowden revelations happened, the whole world of, of uh, academics and uh, tech and, and the tech industry realized, hey, we have a major problem because if certain governments can gain access to these unsecure communications, criminals can too. And they can also use those to, to gain access to the communications. Um, you know, Companies can do corporate espionage on one another very easily uh, because communications within their 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 companies uh, networks and across the internet are unsecure and not secured using encryption. And so once they saw that there was this major problem, right after the Snowden revelations, there was a flurry of activity to start securing the web, start securing these communications using more encryption, using more end-to-end encryption. And so when that happened. You saw governments have a knee-jerk reaction to the fact that they did not have access to all of this unsecured information as they did before. Um, And so I I think we're moving away from this dark ages of privacy from the the, uh, early 2000s to the 2010s to hopefully more a golden age of privacy um, with more end-to-end encryption being used. But certain governments... And law enforcement agencies are doing their damnedest to try and stop that from happening because they're scared that they're going to have to work harder uh, to try and uh, to 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 try and gain access to communications that that they want to have. I think what's remarkable to me is how it relates to what's happening in the cryptocurrency environment, because 
we basically have had those early days of the internet, that parallel in the early days of crypto, where there has been no privacy in cryptocurrency transactions, when people are moving value, which is what was a brand new thing, a brand new capability that uh, was discovered by Satoshi that uh, we could we could come up with this mechanism for transferring value on the internet. But all of that has been completely transparent for the most part until Zcash was available by and made available by Electric Coin Company. And now we're, I believe, we're in the early days of the cryptocurrency industry kind of following, following along on that path to say, well, wait a second, we actually really need privacy. And now we see so many projects across the cryptocurrency ecosystem adding in zero knowledge proof technology to add privacy because in order to have personal freedom and in order to empower democratic society, just as much as you need to be able to have free and private speech, you also need to be able to have private transactions. Actually, I would argue that if you don't have the ability to transact privacy, all of your freedoms are at risk. So there's so many parallels to this, and that's why I am so excited to be able to focus on this fundamental issue of encryption, because I think that this goes to the heart of what we need to have on the internet to promote pretty good policy. And for me, that means to promote economic freedom and to empower democratic society and to give individuals dignity as they do their daily lives on the internet, because everything is on the internet these days, right? If I could jump in here, you really touch on a very interesting thing when it comes to cryptocurrency, you know, online transactions, and as a kind of a parallel to the encryption space for encrypted messaging. Because one thing I've always heard people say is, you know, in the olden days, if you wanted to have a private conversation, you would whisper in someone's ear. That is how you have a private conversation. Uh, you do that in person. That can still happen, for instance. If you wanted to uh, not have an exact, you know, you paid this amount of money for this thing, specific thing, you pay in cash. Uh, you do that in person, you pay in cash. But on the internet, where so many things are are now happening, commerce is now all on, a lot of commerce is on the internet, you can't do that in the same way. And so having that, being able to have those private conversations, being able to have more privacy in what you're buying and what you're spending money on is a really, really important thing. And I think it's also important to note that it's not, this isn't a new thing. That happened in the past. You used to have privacy when it came to conversations. You used to have privacy when it came to buying and selling things. That went away with the early internet. And so what we're returning to now by having things like encryption, better encryption, uh, is getting us closer towards something that we've already had. This isn't a new thing. This isn't now this crazy, you know, insanely private world. We had a more private world in the past. Now we're trying to get ourselves back towards that so that we can actually, you know, enjoy some of those, those the privacy and value that privacy has given humanity for thousands of years. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I want to just take a moment here and say that it's so critical that we have an organization like the Internet Society working on these issues. For those who don't know, the Internet Society was founded by basically the, the fathers of the Internet. They got together and decided they needed an organization to help promote good policy, but also to help promote the development of strong Internet infrastructure and architecture. So the Internet Society has been um, very closely linked to the Internet Engineering Task Force over the years and uh, has been just continually pushing for these good policies. And I just want to say, like the mission, I want to, I want to read the mission just so people are aware. The Internet Society supports and promotes the development of Internet as a global technical infrastructure, a resource to enrich people's lives and a force for good in society. So um, my covert goal here, it's not covert, I'm just going to say it, <laughs> is uh, to, to get the Internet Society to understand that the transfer of value on the Internet is just as important as a transfer of information on the Internet and the ability for us to have uh, people that have enriched lives and, and let the Internet be a force for good. 
So um, eventually, I know this is a path, but and, and you guys have your hands full, but eventually I would love to see the Internet Society make cryptocurrency and privacy in cryptocurrency just to make that a part of your, your policy uh, platform because uh, um, I think it is just absolutely critical. It's what I am doing every day, and I'm so happy that I'm doing it, but we need help. So uh, at some point in the future, I look forward to, to ISOC starting to dedicate maybe some of your time and others to just saying like, we're going to dig into crypto and, and figure this out and make sure that it's a, a an important and, and um, well, it is critical. It's a critical part of, of people's lives on the internet to be able to transfer value privately. Thanks for that. And I, I mean, I think cryptocurrency issues and, and, and crypto in general and has become more and more of a, a major thing in the policy world um, where policymakers are inherently thinking about the internet and also thinking about cryptocurrency hand in hand. So we're starting to see policies that touch on all of those, those all of the pieces. And one of them is, is, is cryptocurrency coming up. And thank you for what you do, because I think there, just like many issues related to the internet, there is a lack of understanding about what things actually are technology technology wise um and what those implications are um when it comes to to cryptocurrency and so especially among among legislators and policymakers and so thank you for what you do because that's very very important to to promoting understanding there also helping me uh, understand the cryptocurrency world as well which is always uh, hard for me sometimes to do <laughs> well let's uh let's get back to our discussion about um encryption and talking about this ecosystem that you're building to defend and safeguard encryption. So the Internet Society has been an integral part of the Global Encryption Coalition. There are many organizations, and maybe you can tell me how many. There's a lot. I know. I've seen the list. It's very long. Electric Coin Company is on that list of organizations who have signed up to say, we support this Global Encryption Coalition mission. And um, maybe you can dig into that a little bit. Tell us about the Global Encryption Coalition and, and why the Internet Society is working through this vehicle to promote encryption. Sure thing. And just like how you work uh, with your pretty good policy community, um, you know, trying to promote activities that would support, uh, support cryptocurrency, the cryptocurrency world, we've been working with the Global Encryption Coalition to try and develop a community of advocates to support uh, strong encryption all around the world. And so we started this in 2020 with uh, two other organizations, uh, the Center for Democracy and Technology, and also um, uh, also Global Partners Digital, uh, which is based in London. And when we kicked off, we had 30 members entirely from civil society who were who had decided to, to join forces to try and protect encryption uh, because we saw the threat in 2020. It hasn't gone away since. Um, and basically what, what groups do to join is they agree to a statement that says, we support the use of strong encryption and we're against threats to undermine it, which is a very, very low bar. Um, it's a big tent coalition, but it's enough of a bar to keep the bad guys out. So that's why we did it. Um, since 2020, uh, since, uh, since May of 2020, we have expanded to over 350 members from around the world. Um, our, we're pretty geographically diverse with a quarter of our membership are based in Africa, uh, nearly a quarter in Europe, um, another 20% in Latin America, about 18% in North America, 14% in the Asia Pacific region and then 2% in the Middle East. And our breakdown is about 67% uh, civil society. It fluctuates a little bit. Uh, civil society groups, then 25% industry groups or industry companies. And then um, lastly, about 8% of us are individual cybersecurity experts, mainly academics. And so how we work is basically we or one big mailing list, to be honest, um, where people raise threats to encryption, uh, raise opportunities for advocacy, and then we work together to try and stop threats when they arise or to promote encryption. And so 
what's really fantastic about it is you have an amazing force multiplier for any member all around the world. If there's a threat to encryption in Mauritius, in Belgium, in the United States, anywhere, suddenly you can, with one email, let the entire world know uh, that there's this threat and ideally give them give the rest of the world an opportunity to act. And so in doing so, you can take a hyper-local uh, piece of advocacy or a hyper-local threat and suddenly make it an international thing. And in many places in the world, once you start getting those international groups and names or even international media talking about a threat, you completely change the tenor of the debate. And you change it in a way that's much more uh, conducive to, towards protecting encryption. And so we've had a lot of success over the years at either stopping threats to encryption or staving, maybe heading them off for a while at least. Um, and uh, we've seen a lot of, of growth and it's been very exciting to, to build this, help build this community of hundreds of groups who are all fighting for encryption. Um, and we're really happy to have Electric Coin Company join. The other thing that we do is we hold Global Encryption Day. So Global Encryption Day is held on the 21st of October every year. Unfortunately, that's a Saturday this year. Um, so it's held around the October 21st uh, each year. We've done it twice, so this will be the third year. But it's an uh, it's a day of action for protecting and promoting encryption. Um, it's built around events held by our community who uh, take the opportunity to promote encryption in their countries in various ways. In Liberia last year, for instance, there was a street pro protest where they are, the Internet Society chapter in Liberia organized this, where they brought a list, a physical list of demands to the government about protecting encryption. In uh, Nigeria, there was trainings on how to use more encryption to protect yourself that they held in um, our one of our members held in marketplaces in Lagos um, to more policy oriented discussions like the one that Electric Coin Company uh, held last year and will be holding uh, this year as well. So it's a lot of fun to see how different groups all around the world uh, are fighting for encryption and looking at ways that we can help each other make that impact because this is not something that the Internet Society or Electric Coin Company or any group can do on their own. It really takes a village to fight back against these threats to encryption, of which there are many. I love that approach to bring people together and to provide a platform for people to communicate. That force multiplier effect that you described makes so much sense. And um, Internet Society and those partners you talked about, CDT and, and, and uh, Global Partners Digital, um, you all are perfectly positioned to do this. And it is very powerful. I personally am on that list. I get to see these updates that come from all over the world, brings them to my attention. And if there's any way I can help, I, I try to. In many cases, there aren't. But, you know, I'm, I'm always on the lookout for ways that I can contribute. And if I see something here, I can raise it. But on the um, Global Encryption Day front, I think that is also critical as well. And um, just to be able to have a, a point in time where we all say we're going to focus on this and we're going to just... Um, think about how important it is and celebrate it to a certain degree. So I kind of have framed this event that we're doing in the Capitol as both recognition and celebration of Global Encryption Day. I think it aligns everyone. Uh, all of us in the tech policy ecosystem, for the most part, are aligned on this issue. And together, you would think that we would be able to really, really move this policy and to defend it with uh, that kind of force. But we can't do it if we're not working together, right? And if we're not coordinated in, in some way. And, and that's the role you're playing. And um, I just, I greatly appreciate it. And thank you for your personal efforts in moving this forward, because I know you personally have been doing so much of the work behind the scenes on this for many years now. One of my goals is to have as many organizations in the cryptocurrency space as possible to join the Global Encryption Coalition. Just to re-emphasize, the bar is very low. You have to agree essentially that to say that you know you promote encryption, and there's a specific wording there, but it's something that everybody can agree to that it works in crypto, I'm sure. So why wouldn't we all be a part of this community? 
there's no charge. There's, there's nothing that you have to do other than just to, to say that you promote and then that you are, want to be a part of the community. So I would call to everyone out there who is listening, get your organizations involved in the Global Encryption Coalition. It is one of these things that I, I view as an absolute no-brainer and is, is critical to our industry. So please do that. Thanks for okay, that. Okay, let's move on. Yeah. <laughs> oh, just to add one last thing. The other thing is we don't take positions on behalf of our membership. So there's no risk to anyone joining that they're going to be roped into a specific position on a specific bill in some place in the world. Every time that there's a threat or an opportunity for advocacy, it's just that. It's an opportunity for advocacy. And you get to decide whether or not your organization or you um, want to engage on that. So uh, the it's free. And also it's free from uh, entanglement. Right. No, that's that's critical for a lot of organizations. They want to to uh, control how they're perceived and how they are pushing forward uh, for policy in their own way. So that's very wise. And, and again, only an organization like ISOC would be able to do something with that kind of forethought and understanding of how other organizations can work together. Let's move on to the next phase of our discussion where we start to begin to talk about specific threats. And I was hoping that, uh, Ryan, I know you're like an an encyclopedia of these things. And um, last year at our breakfast, you just went over so many of them and it was a little bit overwhelming to be honest. And and that's okay. I, I think that our audience needs to understand the scope of the threats that are out there because it's very scary when you start to hear about all of the different ones all around the world. Since most of our audience is here domestic, though, in the U.S., uh, um, I, w- I would love to start there. And if you can, maybe go through some of the things you see that are of concern here in the U.S. And then let's turn to the global ecosystem and see all of the threats there. Sure thing. And yeah, like you said, there's there's a lot of threats, so I don't want to take up uh hours going through them all um, and uh, ranting about their how terrible they are. Um, so I'll just focus on, on, on the U.S. for now and, and rant about how terrible those, those threats are. Um, so I think the, the key thing to note in the U.S. is that every year for the last couple of years, actually every year since about 2016, there have been threats to encryption that have popped up in Congress. Um, and usually with the the backing or support of the FBI um, or NSA uh, as uh, basically giving them more powers to do uh, to, to have access to the communications of citizens. Unfortunately, those powers to have access to end to end encrypted communications could be used by would be used by criminals found and used by criminals to hurt the security and privacy of every user in the United States of an end-to-end encrypted service. Um, so right now in U.S. Congress, there's really four bills that are of major concern for encryption, I'd say. Um, and one of them, it, there's really two reasons, purported reasons for uh, reasonings behind these bills. The first reason is trying to stop the sale of um, of fentanyl and other opioids over the internet, and then the other choice is trying to improve child protection and um, stop the facilitation of child sexual abuse uh, uh, imagery or CSAM on the internet. Unfortunately, despite these being really valid and valuable uh, uh, reasons to have these bills. Both of them undermine encryption to try to do so, or all of them will undermine encryption to do so and make everyone less safe. Um, so starting first with the bill that's aimed at trying to stop the spread of, of uh, or the sale of illegal narcotics online, it's called the Cooper Davis Act. So the Cooper Davis Act of 2023 basically would create more requirements for companies to scan the messages or, or user-generated content on their platforms um, in order to flag any drug-related content to be then sent off to the, the 
uh, Drug Enforcement Agency, the DEA in the U.S., um, for further analysis and potential um, potential prosecution. The problem is with the Cooper Davis Act, this requirement to scan uh, the content re- uh, really would incentivize the use of anti-encryption technologies, um, things like client-side scanning which attempts to um, to scan the content right before it's encrypted, um, but in doing so undermines the whole point of using end-to-end encryption. Um, or things like key escrow or other encryption backdoors that, that have been proposed over the years. Um, because companies would be heavily, heavily incentivized to, uh, to scan this content, this drug-related content, um, for fear of liability, uh, for fear of uh, intermediary liability issues, um, they would be forced to undermine the encryption on their services. Um, and so there's no way to do that scanning for drug content with on end to end encrypted service without undermining encryption. Um, and so the end result of the Cooper Davis bill would be uh, platforms would be forced to start scanning for drug content. And this wouldn't just be images that they would have to be scanning, but it would also be things like uh, 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 text messages um, or, or messages that have, have text, uh, text-based text communications. And in particular, an issue with that is overscanning. Um, so one can imagine um, thinking of, you know, like Breaking Bad Ice uh, is, is a euphemism for, for methamphetamine. And are you now scanning all content for the word ice and grabbing strings of, of data with the word ice in it and now multiply that times a thousand for all the other names of drugs um, or drug related uh, uh, content. And so you have a serious issue with over scanning um, that could lead to some, some problems for privacy, but then also you're creating a vulnerability where uh, criminals could use that vulnerability to start scanning for other things. Um, uh, are they scanning for political content? Are they scanning for uh, uh, gender and sexuality uh, related content? All of those things. So that's one bill. Um, my understanding, my my at least my feeling is that with what's happening in Congress now, right now, at least the Cooper Davis bill might be unlikely to pass. Um, of course, it could always be reintroduced next year or, I mean, continue going next year. Um, the three bills that are on the child safety side are are stronger threats, I'd say. Um, and these are the Earn it Act, the Cooper Davis Act, and the Kids Online Safety Act. And all three of these bills are really, really important to understand and to understand how they impact encryption and also just how they impact um intermediary liability on the internet um, because each of them kind of tangles with the role that uh, platforms and other intermediaries have in uh, in handling content on the internet. The Earn it Act and the Stop CSAM Act um, both try to do very similar things to, um, to get incentivized companies to do scanning or other content moderation on content going across their platforms. Um, both of them introduce liability, or the threat of liability for platforms, if they aren't seen as doing enough to get rid of bad content on their platforms. For the Earn it Act, that is criminal liability that could be brought by uh, prosecution from states. For the Stop CCM Act, that's actually civil liability that could be brought by victims of, for instance, revenge porn or child pornography, um, who don't think that platforms are doing enough to protect their uh, protect their users uh, and, and moderate content. The problem is, these would also pl- apply to end-to-end encrypted services, and you already have law enforcement uh, voices saying that companies are being irresponsible by using end-to-end encryption. Um, And so you're going to have prosecutors prosecuting uh, uh, companies for using end-to-end encryption and not using the tools like client-side scanning or key escrow or other encryption backdoors 
to try and moderate content on their platforms because they actually can't when it's an end-to-end -end encrypted service. Um, and so you have that new criminal liability there. For Stop CSAM, it gets even worse um, because first off, Stop CSAM applies to basically all computer intermediaries, which is everything from a uh, network operator to a content delivery network to a platform like WhatsApp um, to a uh, all sorts of basically every stakeholder on the internet would be affected by this um, if any content goes across their their systems. So one problem with that is just sheer scope of of the stop CSAM acts uh, impacts. The second issue is this issue of civil liability where the if a victim of CSAM or of of revenge porn brings a suit against a end encrypted service for not doing content moderation um first off the the platform could be held li found liable but second off they'd have to fight all of those in court um and so with both of those, you have this really, really strong incentive for companies not to use end-to-end -end encryption because they want to protect themselves from from liability. Um, and so it's almost a sneaky way of attacking encryption where it doesn't outright outlaw encryption, but the end effect of it will be that encryption will be undermined. So then the last law that I'll talk about, which it's a little bit less of an impact on encryption, um, but I think is really important to, to talk about in the context of the other two bills, is the Kids Online Safety Act. So the Kids Online Safety Act, or COSA, um, would create the ability for uh, states' attorneys general to create duties of care for platforms and companies on the internet. Um, and these duties of care would relate to are companies doing enough to protect children from harmful content and content that's harmful for children? Um, this could potentially uh, create state level laws about or state level duty of care duties of care um, that would incentivize companies not to use end to end encryption, for instance, um, just like the other two laws. But also, it creates the potential of a fragmented legal space for the internet and for internet inter intermediaries um, when it comes to content moderation. One can imagine that what the Texas Attorney General sees as harmful to children could be very, very different from the Attorney General in Vermont. And so companies will be forced to decide what content that they're going to try and moderate uh, based on which states. Are they going to comply in some states and not comply in others? Are they going to leave the market in some cases? Um, and so you have this potentially dangerous scenario for internet fragmentation um, in the United States uh, for platforms and companies with uh, the Kids Online Safety Act, and potentially also a second order effect of attacking encryption, depending on what the state's attorney generals do. And several attorney generals in states over the years have made uh made statements that were highly uh uh highly um that were highly aggressive towards encryption and and not positive um towards encryption at all and so one could see those duties of care um be, not being made in a way that would be protective of encryption um yeah that's it it is overwhelming a little bit i mean <laughs> those are pretty serious threats and it, it um it's honestly remarkable that we have so many politicians instead of championing encryption to say that this is what provides for our free society um they're they're going down this rabbit hole of saying that well if we just weaken it a little bit we'll be able to avert all of these terrible harms they are terrible harms they're, they're horrible no one wants to see that happen on the internet but I, I always um, have to stop and say, well, there's a there's a fundament, fundamental infrastructure of the Internet that needs to be secure. And this is that infrastructure. This is what we have to have as a baseline to provide security for our for our free society and to provide a, a good environment for everyone on the Internet. 
And I, I wish there were ways to stop these bad things, but but um, either providing a backdoor through encryption or eliminating encryption is certainly not the path. So um, thank you for giving us some detail on those and listing those all out. Uh, I, I think that our hopefully we'll talk more about those at our event coming up in DC. I, I would ask you to talk about the global uh, landscape a little bit, but I, I realize that might be too much and we have already spent quite a bit of time. Is there just a couple of things you want to say about that before we move on? I can give a very, very, very quick uh, whistle stop tour of several places that are, are talking about encryption. So I think the key one for people to know is that the United Kingdom just passed their online safety bill. Um, the online safety bill in the United Kingdom gives the, the government a lot of powers related to the internet, um, and some of which are, are not fantastic. And one of those is the power to for Ofcom, which is their, their internet regulator, to force companies to use what they call, quote, accredited technologies to provide uh, access to, to do content moderation on the internet. Um, these accredited technologies look like they're going to mainly be client-side scanning or other types of encryption backdoors. Um, and the concern is that if Ofcom uses these powers, they're going to force companies to undermine end-to-end -end encryption, um, which would be absolutely terrible. Um, one key concession that the UK government did make in the final days of the bill um, being introduced or being being passed uh, was that they said they wouldn't use these powers unless there was a safe way of doing this um, of of doing these these scanning techniques, and a safe way doesn't exist yet. They've since walked back that statement a bit, and so we're in a little bit of a, a wait and see mood in terms of of how the UK government acts with those powers. But the potential is very, very bad. Luckily, industry has been pretty unified in opposing this, um, and Meta has said that they would uh, leave the market, uh, leave, take WhatsApp app off the market in the UK. Signal the same, said the same, if they are asked to undermine their, the security of their service. Um, and so that's a very, very positive development that we've seen is that companies are willing to, you know, put their money where their mouth is when it comes to protecting uh, the security of their users. Um, and so we really welcome seeing that. The other key one to note is also in Europe. So the European Union is looking at their own uh, regulation against the spread of, of child sexual abuse material their CSA, anti-CSA regulation. Um, that's uh, what it's called. And so they're trying to figure out if there are things that they can can force platforms and companies to do with regards to content moderation um, in order to stop the spread of, of, of child sexual abuse imagery online. Um, again, as you as you heard with um, with the problems with the Stop CSAM and with the Erna Act, um, there's major concerns, if not written well, that these the anti CSA law in the European Union will have the same effect of undermining uh, uh, the use of encryption, of strong encryption in Europe. Um, and Europe is a very big market, and so that's particularly concerning. Um, there's a few other places around the world where encryption is also under threat. Um, that pop up from time to time. Brazil, for instance, is still has a court case that they're still debating about five years later about whether or not uh, a judge could block the use of WhatsApp um, as a uh, as a punitive measure for not giving end-to-end -end encrypted communications up during a uh, during an investigation. Um, and also, of course, places like Russia and China and other authoritarian nations around the world have either actively outlawed encryption uh, or have a de facto ban on the use of strong encryption. Um, and those places are uh, just not conducive to, to the security and privacy of their users. Um, unfortunately, changing the laws there will be a lot harder, I think, than uh, the fight for protecting encryption in the rest of the world. Um, but hopefully someday, you know, Folks in Russia and China can use strong encryption to protect their communications um, and uh, engage fully in the internet. 
My goodness, um, so many threats, and that uh, the one you talk about in the the UK um, with uh, Ofcom trying to enforce accredited technologies—is that what you said? That is the word. Um, I, I have to say that just made my skin crawl. I mean, I, that is like perfect George Orwell 1984 stuff there. there and I just can't believe that um, that kind of policy has been put into legislation there. And uh, it's it's horrible. And that's just that's a sad state of affairs. I think in all of this, one trend that we've seen, and I didn't really talk about it when I was talking about the, the history of this all, but. In a really cynical sense, I've seen governments for the past 10 years come up with different reasons for breaking encryption. Um, In the early 2010s, it was all about protecting against terrorists because that was the threat that people engaged with. Then, um, especially in the US during the Trump administration, it was cartels. We need to stop the spread of, of fentanyl and other things coming from Mexico. We need to break into encryption so that we can stop the cartels. And now in recent years, seemingly globally, governments have focused on protecting children. And from a very cynical viewpoint, um, this is the hardest one to fight against. It's very, very hard for a legislator to vote against a child safety bill because you're trying to we have to protect the children. And so even though the the reasons that that all of these laws are being introduced or, or being legislation is, is being come up with um, ostensibly are very good reasons protecting children, good reason, stopping the spread of, of illegal narcotics, a good reason, stopping terrorism, also a great reason. At the end of the day, the impact, the 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 consequences intended or unintended of undermining end-to-end encryption are way too dangerous for for the security and privacy for everyone. And you put, like you said, it's kind of an Orwellian situation where now if you're a uh, dissident in a country um, and relying on end-to-end encrypted technologies, if those technologies get undermined, you could be under threat, physical threat. Similarly, um, I think of, I live in, in the Western part of, of Virginia in a very small community. Um, and I think of, of especially like trans and LGBT youth who are trying to communicate with one another and find a sense of community, potentially in towns or, or, or parts of the state and parts of the U.S. that aren't conducive to finding that community or safely finding that community. Um, having access to things like end-to-end encryption is vital for not only protecting yourself, but feeling comfortable enough to engage fully as who they want to be. And uh, I, it really worries me that at-risk communities are the ones who are going to feel the impacts the most um, when these laws pass or if these laws pass. Um, and so there's, there's a lot at stake here. Um, and it's not just... It's not just the economics, because I mean, we've also seen that 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 the tech industry loses lots of money when bad encryption bills pass. Um, but it's also that human impact of, of the loss of security and privacy that, for some people, could be really, really bad. Yeah, I'm very, very concerned, and um, this is something that will certainly affect all of us if bad policy is implemented and adopted. So I can assure you that I'm going to still fight. I'm going to continue to fight for this and try to raise awareness. I know you will. I know ISOC will and others through the Global Encryption Coalition. And with that, we've, uh, we're have we almost at time, actually. And we've covered a lot. So we've covered much of what I wanted to. I guess I just want to wrap this up with um, one more pitch for the event coming up in just less than two weeks on October 17th. 11.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. It will be live streamed for those who want to watch online. So you can go to the PGP for Crypto live stream channel to watch it there. But we have a great lineup. And it's uh, in my view, you're going to be able to hear directly from some luminaries in the tech industry and in the cryptocurrency industry in particular who are focused on encryption and who are building products that, that work to defend encryption and defend the, uh, an individual's 
ability to communicate online safely, transfer value online safely, store files online safely, all powered through cryptocurrency. We're going to have uh, Marta Belcher. She is the president and chair of the Filecoin Foundation. We're going to have Henry Holtzman, the chief technology officer of MobileCoin. We have Philip Martin, the chief security officer of Coinbase. And then we have my CEO, Zuko Wilcox, the chief executive officer of Electric Coin Company. These, uh, this group will be moderated by a good friend um, and uh, longtime uh, mentor of mine, actually, Dr. Eric Berger. He's a research professor of NextG Security and a research director at, at the Commonwealth Cyber Initiative. Just an amazing guy with such incredible background in industry and academia and government, serving in very high levels in government. And not only that, but we have the... Uh, the House Whip, Congressman Tom Emmer, who's going to give opening remarks. So this is going to be a really special event. It's in a very special venue. It's in a large auditorium in the U.S. Capitol complex at the U.S. Capitol Visitor Center. It's a, it's the congressional auditorium. It's massive. So I implore all of you to try to be there physically if you can. And if you can't, uh, then please join remotely. And of course, I'm going to have video online afterwards so you can enjoy it afterwards too and help share that great resource. So with that, I think we're ready to wrap up. I just want to thank you again, Ryan, for your work. Um, you're an inspiration. You're, you're so critical to developing pretty good policy for the internet. And, uh, and I hope you continue to do that for many, many years. And uh, I look forward to working with you on many global encryption day events going forward. Thanks, Paul. And same to you. And if folks do make it out to the event, I'll be there also in the audience and would be happy to, to chat and talk to you more about encryption and especially how you can get involved because it really takes a village and it really is going to take a growing village to, to stop these threats to encryption. And we need your help. So come help us in this fight because it's a big one. Absolutely. So we'll see you there. I want to thank the audience for joining us today to help develop pretty good policy for the cryptocurrency world. We'll see you next time.